Good evening. This is Christopher Lee. In Jerome K. Jerome's The Man of Science. I met a man in the Strand one day that I knew very well, as I thought, though I had not seen him for years. We walked together to Charing Cross, and there we shook hands and parted. Next morning, I spoke of this meeting to a mutual friend, and then I learned for the first time that the man had died six months before. The natural inference was that I had mistaken one man for another. What was remarkable about the matter, however, was that throughout our walk, I had conversed with the man under the impression that he was that other dead man, and whether by coincidence or not, his replies had never once suggested to me my mistake. As soon as I finished, Jefferson, who had been listening very thoughtfully, asked me if I believed in spiritualism to its fullest extent. Well, that's rather a large question. What do you mean by spiritualism to its fullest extent. Let me put a definite case. Suppose a man died with the dearest wish of his heart unfulfilled. Do you believe that his spirit might have power to return to earth and complete the interrupted work? I was told a story this morning at the hospital by an old French doctor, said Jefferson. The story begins with a great wrong done by one man unto another man. What the wrong was, I do not know. I'm inclined to think, however, it was connected with the woman. Still, that is only conjecture, and the point is immaterial. The man who had done the wrong fled, and the other man followed him. It became a point-to-point -point race, the first man having the advantage of a day's start. The course was the whole world, and the stakes by the first man's life. The first man, never knowing how far or how near the other was behind him, and hoping now and again that he might have baffled him, would rest for a while. The second man, knowing always just how far the first one was before him, never paused, and thus each day the man who was spurred by hate drew nearer to the man who was spurred by fear. At this town, the answer to the never varied question would be at seven o'clock last evening, monsieur. Seven? Ah, eighteen hours. Give me something to eat, quick, while the horses are being put to. At the next, the calculation would be sixteen hours. Passing a lonely chalet, monsieur put his head out of the window. How long since a carriage passed this way, with a tall, fair man inside? Such a one passed early this morning, monsieur. Thanks. Drive on. A hundred francs apiece if you're through the pass before daybreak. And what for dead horses, monsieur? Twice their value when living. One day, the man who was ridden by fear looked up and saw before him the open door of a cathedral, and passing in, knelt down and prayed. He prayed long and fervently. He prayed that he might be forgiven his sin, and more important still, that he might be delivered from his adversary. And a few chairs from him, facing him, knelt his enemy, praying also. But the second man's prayer, being a thanksgiving, merely, was short, so that when the first man raised his eyes, he saw the face of his enemy gazing at him across the chair tops with a mocking smile upon it. He made no attempt to rise, but remained kneeling, fascinated by the look of joy that shone out of the other man's eyes and the other man moved the high-backed chairs one by one and came towards him softly. Then, just as the man who had been wronged stood beside the man who had wronged him, full of gladness that his opportunity had come, 
there burst from the cathedral tower a sudden clash of bells, and the man whose opportunity had come <sighs> broke his heart and fell back dead, with that mocking smile still playing round his mouth. And so he lay there. Then the man who had done the wrong rose up and passed out, praising God. What became of the body of the other man is not known. Years passed away, and the survivor and the tragedy became a worthy and useful citizen and a noted man of science. In his laboratory were many objects necessary to him in his researches, and prominent among them stood in a certain corner a human skeleton. It was a very old and much mended skeleton, and one day the long-expected end arrived, and it tumbled to pieces. Thus it became necessary to purchase another. The man of science visited a dealer he well knew within the shadow of the towers of Notre Dame. The little parchment-faced old man had just the very thing that Monsieur wanted, a singularly fine and well-proportioned study. It should be sent round and set up in Mrs. Laboratory that very afternoon. The dealer was as good as his word. When Monsieur entered his laboratory that evening, the thing was in its place. Monsieur seated himself in his high-backed chair and tried to collect his thoughts. But Monsieur's thoughts were unruly and inclined to wander, and to wander always in one direction. Monsieur opened a large volume and commenced to read. He read of a man who had wronged another and fled from him, the other man following. Finding himself reading this, he closed the book angrily and went and stood by the window and looked out. He saw before him the sun-pierced nave of a great cathedral, and on the stones lay a dead man with a mocking smile upon his face. Cursing himself for a fool, he turned away with a laugh. <laughs> but his laugh was short-lived, for it seemed to him that something else in the room was laughing also. <laughs> Struck suddenly still, with his feet glued to the ground, he stood listening for a while then sought with starting eyes the corner from where the sound seemed to come. But the white thing standing there was only grinning. Monsieur wiped the damp sweat from his head and hands and stole out. For a couple of days, he did not enter the room again. On the third, he opened the door and went in. To shame himself, he took his lamp in his hand, and crossing over to the far corner where the skeleton stood, examined it. A set of bones, bought for three hundred francs. Was he a child, to be scared by such a bogey? He held his lamp up in front of the thing's grinning head. The flame of the lamp flickered, as though a faint breath had passed over it. The man explained this to himself by saying that the walls of the house were old and cracked, and that the wind might creep in anywhere. He repeated this explanation to himself as he recrossed the room, walking backwards, with his eyes fixed on the thing. When he reached his desk, he sat down and gripped the arms of his chair till his fingers turned white. He tried to work but the empty sockets in that grinning head seemed to be drawing him towards them. Glancing fearfully about him, his eye fell upon a high screen standing before the door. He dragged it forward and placed it between himself and the thing, so that he could not see it, nor it see him. Then he sat down again to his work. For a while, he forced himself to look at the book in front of him, but at last, unable to control himself any longer, 
he suffered his eyes to follow their own bent. It may have been an hallucination. He may have accidentally placed the screen so as to favor such an illusion. But what he saw was a bony hand coming round the corner of the screen. Ah! And with a cry, he fell to the floor in a swoon. The people of the house came running in and lifting him up, carried him out and laid him upon his bed. As soon as he recovered, his first question was, where had they found the thing? Where was it? And when they told him they'd seen it standing where it always stood, he listened to their talk about overwork and the necessity for change and rest, and said they might do with him as they would. So for many months, the laboratory door remained locked. Then there came a chill autumn evening. When the man of science opened it again and closed it behind him, he lighted his lamp and sat down in his high-backed chair. And the old terror returned to him. But this time he meant to conquer himself. His nerves were stronger now, and his brain clearer. He would fight his unreasoning fear. He crossed to the door and locked himself in, flung the key to the other end of the room where it fell among jars and bottles with an echoing clatter. Later on, his old housekeeper going her final round tapped at his door and wished him good night, as was her custom. She received no response at first, and growing nervous, tapped louder and called again. And at length, an answering good night came back to her. She thought little about it at the time, but afterwards she remembered that the voice that had replied to her had been strangely grating and mechanical. Trying to describe it, she likened it to such a voice as she would imagine coming from a statue. Next morning, his door remained still locked. When evening came and he did not appear, his servants gathered outside the room. They listened, but could hear no sound. They shook the door and called to him and beat with their fists upon the wooden panels. No sound came from the room. Becoming alarmed, they decided to burst open the door. He sat, bolt upright, in his high-backed chair. When they drew near and the light fell upon him, they saw the livid marks of bony fingers round his throat. And in his eyes there was a terror such as is not often seen in human eyes. Brown was the first to break the silence that followed. He asked me if I had any brandy on board. He said he felt he should like just a nip of brandy before going to bed. That's one of the chief charms of Jeffson's stories. They always make you feel you want a little brandy. These fireside tales are abridged by Tamsin Collison, with music by Chris O'Shaughnessy, and produced by Frank Sterling. They are a unique production for Radio 2. This is Christopher Lee, wishing you a very good night.